Listen, thanks for coming. This, uh, my name is Dr. Jay Smith. I have been to ELF maybe six times. Uh, let's see, the last time I was here was three years ago. And uh, so it's been a while. I no longer am in Europe, though I lived in London for 25 years, uh, working with radical Muslims. The, we just got news, we're just getting news as we speak that looks like the Muslims have been on the killing spree again and 17 tourists have lost their lives in Egypt. So it's, it's this, these Muslims that uh, Hatun and I have been on a team. We've been working together for about six years. And uh, we particularly work in this area of apologetics and polemics. This is our area of expertise. Uh, I didn't start out that way. I started out much more in the friendship evangelism, friendship methodology, the grace method. These are the kind of things that I was brought up on. Uh, these are the paradigms that I was taught. This is the methodology I began to use until I went to London in 1992. And in 1992, I came across a very much more radical, more orthodox, much more aggressive type of Muslim, and much more adept when it comes to understanding our scriptures and also understanding our Lord Jesus Christ. What's, what was fascinating, the first time I ever went down to a place, do you all know Speaker's Corner? Do you know what I'm talking about? When I, okay, Speaker's Corner is an institution in London, Hyde Park, uh, that has been around for 160 years. It's the bastion of freedom of speech. It's, there's no other place on earth like it. It would, could not exist anywhere else. Uh, we couldn't, we've tried to have Speaker's Corners in America and we have too many guns. It just doesn't work. England has one of the strongest anti-gun policies there, and so that's why it can exist and still does exist today. We tried it in Italy. It did work uh, there in, in um, where is uh, Francesco? What is his city? Milan. Uh, there in the piazza. We got up and we actually did it in the piazza, and uh, Francesco was in a ladder next to me. You get up on these little kitchen ladders. That's, you know, little two steps high, just like you have in a kitchen and you take on any Muslim on any question at any time, and it's exciting because Muslims love that type of engagement. We don't, but Muslims do. And it stands to reason they do because they come from oral cultures. You know what I mean by that? Most Muslims that you meet, they come from either, well, the Middle East, but the vast majority of Muslims do not come from the Arab-speaking world. They come from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. And then, of course, further to the east, your side, this direction, Malaysia, and specifically Indonesia, places like that. They come from North Africa. And in most of their cultures, they learn by memorizing. They learn by hearing teachers, sheikhs, or imams, or peers. And it's these teachers that, they, that take the Quran, this book right here, and they not only read it and memorize it, all their talibes are permitted or demanded to memorize this. They start memorizing this book by, uh, at, the, at the age of three. And if you go into many of their cultures, you will see them and they'll be sitting there going back and forth, memorizing verse after verse. They will not understand what they're memorizing because it's in Arabic. And only 15% of Muslims speak Arabic. 85% don't speak Arabic, but they will memorize it in Arabic because they believe that it is God's holy word. It is, well, as they believe, it is eternal. You don't question it, you don't critique it, you memorize it. Now, what's fascinating is as Muslims come in contact with Europeans, they then realize that we have a different book. This book, the bigger one. You notice I keep it bigger for a reason. It's the, the bigger, the better book. This is the book they come in contact with. And when you do a comparison between these two books, there's no comparison, is there? No, you probably don't know because you've not read this book. We're not taught to read this book here in Europe. How many have you have read this book in your own language? Not the whole thing. Okay, but parts of it. In Norwegian? In uh, English. In English, okay. Albanian. In Albanian, you've read it? Okay. Did you understand it? Well, not many people can say that. <laughs> it's very difficult to understand. So you can see the dilemma for many Muslims. 
There is only one complete story in the entire Quran. That's chapter 12, the story of Joseph. Other than that, it's very difficult to understand. They can read this book much easier. And what's interesting, once they read this book, they start to hear things they never heard before. And they start to question. And the beautiful thing about Muslims and what I love about them is that Muslims have no difficulty confronting our Bible. They have no difficulty confronting us. They have no difficulty confronting the, our Lord Jesus Christ. And most Muslims, now I've been working with Muslims for almost 40 years now, and almost every Muslim, whether they are radical or nominal or liberal, in every case, they always confront two things, the Bible and Jesus, the book and the man, the book and the man. Because of that, what we're going to do today is we're going to show you how or what are the most often asked questions that they're confronting us with and how to answer them. But I'm not just going to answer them apologetically. That's apologetics, right? I'm also going to confront them polemically. Do you know what that word means? Does anybody not know what polemics means? Okay. Do you play football? Oh, you're American. No, you're no good. Well, yes, no. Let's use you. No, no, I'm Egyptian. You're Egyptian. Yeah. Okay. You've been in America. Yeah. American football okay. has two teams, right? Yes. But on each team, there are also two teams, offense and defense. Oh, yes. Am I correct? Yes. In fact, that's probably even a better example than the rest of you Europeans who only have one team, but you have two different, really, you have two different halves of each team. Am I correct? And when you defend the goal, you need to have a good goalie, right? Uh, well, no, you need to have a good goalie, but you need to have just really hefty men that yes. may defend the others from using and making a touchdown, in your case, from scoring the goal. That's called defense. Am I correct? Now, in Christianity, defense would be apologetics, okay? And we're pretty good at apologetics. I mean, we have a whole, what, two tracks of apologetics at this conference. And most schools will teach apologetics. How many of you have had courses on apologetics? Most all of you. Okay. Apologetics is something that we do because we get attacked all over the world. And historically, we have been confronted for 2,000 years. Thank God we have because that sharpens us, doesn't it? Now, in America, Vince Lombardi, you know that name? Green Bay Packers. No, I'm, I'm Egyptian. You're Egyptian. I thought you were... <laughs> Okay, and, and he had a famous phrase that he always said, the best defense is a good offense. There you good. There's another American. <laughs> the best defense is a good offense. The best way to win the game, yes, two, yes, please do defend. But if you really want to win the game, go against the others. This is what General Patton said when he said to his uh, men before he sent them out to battle in the Second World War. Men, I don't want you to die for your country. Make sure the others die for their country. <laughs> this is something that we call polemics, going the other direction. And am I correct? In the American football team, the offense are the better known players. Yes. Am I also correct? In Europe, the yeah. football, the strikers, by far the best known players. They are the Christian Ronaldos, Lionel Messi's of the world, right? They are the, certainly the best paid. They are the ones that win the game. Now, what in the world, or what, where in the world do we have an offense? There is no offense. That's polemics. Polemics is the opposite of apologetics. It goes the other direction and confronts the other. Ah, I lie. We do have polemics when it comes to humanists or atheists. Am I correct? In every seminary, you're taught to the the teleological argument and the cosmological <laughs> argument, the moral argument, every one of these arguments on confronting the atheists. And we're very good at that. If any of you have Jehovah Witnesses come to your door, you're taught every argument how to confront their scriptures and how to confront their theology. The same with Mormons, am I correct? But when it comes to Islam, suddenly, no polemics. There's no school in the world that teaches Islamic polemics, except us in London. We're the only ones. Hatun, let me ask you. You use polemics, correct? I do. And you use apologetics, correct? I do. And you do them simultaneously. Yes. 
In fact, you almost cannot do one without the other. She actually does it every Sunday. We will be at Speaker's Corner next Sunday, and we're going to use it. In fact, we're going to start with polemics. We're going to confront the Quran next Sunday. The material that I'm going to introduce on Tuesday night, we're going to take to Speaker's Corner, get up on a ladder, and we're going to use that against the Muslims. It'll be the first time most of them will ever have seen this material. Now, polemics is difficult because most people, whenever I mention that, in Christian circles, they say this is not Christ-like. Christ never used polemics. Is that true? Did Christ ever use polemics? Not sure? Okay, where? Give me an example. Absolutely. From verse 13 to verse 33, the entire chapter, you hypocrites, you den of vipers, you white sepulchers, the entire chapter is all polemical. The, probably the best example of polemics in the New Testament would be Paul. Paul was very polemical. In fact, if you want to read a good number of chapters on polemics, just open up the book of Acts and read from chapter 17 to 19, where he went to uh, there in uh, Cappadocia, Berea, Ephesus, almost every city he went into, he went right into the synagogues and he used polemics. Now, they threw him out. Sometimes they threw him into prison. He got beaten. Twice they tried to stone him to death. And he caused a riot in Ephesus. So he did get reaction. When you use polemics, people are going to react. And I think that is the problem here in the West, in Europe. We are so fearful of being disliked. We want to be loved. Do we not? Christians want to be loved. And you're not going to be loved if you use polemics especially against Islam. So I'm not here to do polemics. Tomorrow we'll be doing polemics mostly. But today what we're going to do is looking at apologetics and we're going to use 10 questions that I think are some of the most often asked questions. You're supposed to, you were supposed to get a handout, but I understand if you have the app, look at it, these questions, these areas will be on your app. We've modernized since 2016. <laughs> So if you have your app, let's go ahead and open up and let's start with the very first one. And this is the question of whether or not Yahweh is the same as Allah. Yahweh would be the, the name of our God. Allah would be the name of the Muslim God. How many people believe we share the same God? Just off the, no one's going to raise their hands. Oh, that's unfortunate. In most churches I go to in America, at least a few people raise their hands. Because this is a this is a common this is a common uh, assumption in the American church, maybe not in Europe, that we do share the same God. So I'm assuming all of you believe we don't share the same God. Am I correct? Muslims will believe we share the same God. The reason why is they believe that the Allah of the Quran, and let's say the Allah of the Bible of the Arabic Bible, your Bible, is the same name, both. Gods of both scriptures go back to Abraham. Therefore, it stands to reason we share the same God. So, you're going to be my Muslim today, okay? I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable. That's good. You're going to be Abdul for today, okay? We give you a completely new name. A slave of God. Hmm? No, I want him to be Abdul. I want him to be a slave today because I want him to be <laughs> totally obedient to me. I want you to be submissive. I want you to be obedient. That's what your name means, okay? So, Abdul, we share the same God. Just say yes to everything I say. Okay. I want to shake your hand. God bless you, Abdul. I'm so glad that you finally have admitted that Allah of the Quran and Yahweh of the Bible are the same God. I'm so glad you have finally admitted that Allah is triune, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad you have finally admitted that Allah came to earth and walked and talked in the cool of the day. No, finally, not. you have admitted that Allah no. died on the cross and rose again no, and that he has a son. No. I did not say any of that. See? And usually they pull their hand out of mine before I finish. And they recoil. Now what have I just done? I've used four areas where we disagree using the same name. But look at the four areas I've used. Have you noticed? He immediately realized something was wrong here. And he will never say we share the same God again. Because, and how long did that take me? 15 seconds. 
Can you see how quick you can do this? But what I'm doing as a Christian, I'm nailing down who my God is. My God is triune. Immediately, you cannot say that Allah is triune. Immediately, I can see your eyes starting to widen, even as you say, you put on the cap really well. <laughs> Secondly, you know that your God does not come to earth. Allah never comes to earth. Because if He does come to earth, then He would be finite, like us. And we would be corrupting that idea of God. How can the infinite take on a finite form? Thirdly, no Muslim will ever agree that God would die. Certainly not an ignoble death, especially on the cross. They would throw that out. And most importantly, and this is probably the most difficult one for a Muslim, to hear me say that his God has a son. So those are four areas, and stop and think. Those are the four areas that we agree, disagree with Islam the most. Have you noticed they all surround the person of Jesus Christ? Really, the difference between Abdul and me is the person of Jesus Christ. No wonder almost all the accusations against us are against Christ, which gets me excited because that means I can talk about him for the rest of the day. Do you see how easy it is? And that's why Muslims are the easiest to talk to, because they want to talk about Issa, Jesus. Now in two days, Hatun's going to do a, a, here in this room, I think it is, isn't it? She's going to unpack Issa and Jesus. So I'm not going to take her thunder. Wait till you hear what she has to say about Issa, who is the real Jesus. Is the Jesus of the Quran the same as the Jesus of the Bible? In the same token, the Allah of the Quran is not the same as the Allah of your Bible. Because your name for God in the Arabic Bible is Allah. Am I correct? Yes. Okay, let's take that apart. I'm going, to, I'm going to have three problems with that. Not as an Arab Christian. I'm going to have three problems with that name. First and foremost, since we share the same name, Allah, in both books, does that mean it's the same God? No, your name is Abdul, right? Yes. Are there other Abduls in the world? Yes. Probably millions. Are you all the same person? Of course not. Can you see how simplistic that is? Yet I hear so many Americans, I'm not sure I can say Europeans, who believe since they have the same name, they must be the same God. So that's the first thing. Dispel that one. You may share the same name, but you don't share the same person. Secondly, when you look at Allah of the Bible and you look at Allah of the Quran, there's, there is a problem right there because in the Arabic Bible, and this has been a problem, the Arabic Bible was translated by Europeans and Americans, not by Arabs. By Van Dyke himself. By who? Van Dyke. Van Dyke. And who, what was the principle that Van Dyke used to incorporate Allah into the Bible? From a European. Yeah, exactly. Actually, he was an American. His name is Eugene Nida. And Eugene Nida started the principle of what we call dynamic equivalence. Are you familiar with that term? Whenever you go to a foreign language, you find dynamic equivalence to that name. So when they came to Arabic, they wanted to find the God that was equivalent in the language. And of course, by the time uh, Van Dyck was translating the Bible, Islam controlled Egypt. And that's why he then incorporated Allah into the Bible. Do you see a problem with that? When you incorporate the name of the God that is there, you also incorporate the meaning. Are you all familiar with form and meaning? These are sociological terms. The form is Allah. The meaning, however, comes with it. So suddenly in the Muslim mind, the Allah of the Bible becomes Al-Rahman Al-Rahim. Bismillah Al-Rahman Al-Rahim. Who is that? That's the God of the Muslim. That is the very first verse of the Quran, that is the Bismillah, which defines who Allah is, and Allah is always the compassionate one, the merciful one. Immediately, the Allah of the Bible becomes the Quranic Allah. Can you see the problem here? And this has been done all over the world now, not just in Arabic. We're having this problem in every major translation. Because when you take the name that exists there, you take the meaning that comes with that name from the existing culture, especially, this is a problem, especially in a Muslim culture, because that Muslim culture has already indoctrinated that name. It has already given the meaning to that name, and that, main, that name can only be the Quranic meaning. There is the problem with dynamic equivalence. 
And to extricate it now, can you do that? It's hard. It's difficult. Even when you talk to your fellow Egyptians, you're going to have to spit maybe five to ten minutes trying to say no, 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 no. Now, let me just give you the example. Just shake their hands and say, thank God to do those four things. And that should help you much quicker. So that's the second problem. The third problem is that we now know quite a bit about Allah. We're now doing some historical studies on this name. And what we now know is that Allah is not an Arabic name. Did you know that? It actually is a Nabataean name. The Nabataeans, if you look at the history of the Arab world, especially that part of the Arab world, the Nabataeans were the precursors to Arabic. The Arabic language that we, have and that we use today comes from the Nabataean script. The Nabataeans had as their headquarters Petra in Jordan. Petra is very famous. It is the, was not, it was, uh, the Petra was never a capital because the Nabataeans had no political movement. They did not, they were nothing more than nomads. They were traders. They were the ones that traded all over the world. But what they would do is they would always come to Petra and carve these beautiful temples and beautiful tombs out of sheer rock. So when you go to Petra today, and uh, Sal Medina Saleh, these are the two major cities of the Petrans who are all over the world. They were in India, they were in Pakistan, they lived in many other places because they were traders, but they always came to be buried in Petra and in Medina Saleh. And their, their language then became the language of trade. That language then is what Arabic was derived from. Arabic is actually a very new language. And the god of the Petrans, the god of the Nabataeans, was named Dushara. That's his formal name. But Dushara is not his only name. He has a generic title, Ilaha. Now, Allah means what? God. The God. It's not even a name. It's a title. How many of you knew that before today? Allah is the God, as Allah is the God to Dushara, which is the formal name of Allah. But see, here's the real problem. Dushara has a wife. Her name in is Al-Uzza. Her title is Alat, which is the feminine form of Allah. Am I correct? Now, have you read the Quran? Have any of you read the Quran here? Have you read the chapter 53 or you read chapter 53 in the Quran? What do you notice in the chapter 53, verse 19 and 20 of the Quran? Alat, Almanat, and Al Uzza. The three names, the three goddesses known as the satanic verses are in the Quran. Two of them are the same goddess. One is the formal name, the Nabataean name, the other is the generic the title of that goddess. But doesn't it say in the Quran, in chapter 6, verse 101, that Allah cannot have a wife? Yet Allah, the Nabataean God, has a wife named Aluza or Alat. What does that say now about Allah? He's not handsome. He's what? He's not handsome. Say it again. He's not handsome to his wife. Not handsome to his wife. I, I, sometimes I have no idea where you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see that this is a polytheistic God? This is a pagan God? This is a God that has no right being in any holy book. And more than that, this is a borrowed God. But then most of what we see in the Quran is borrowed from other sources. They've got the wrong God. Is, do we have a generic name for God? Yeah, we do. In Hebrew, what is it? Elohim. There is probably the closest equivalent that you can find to Allah. Although Allah is singular, Elohim would be plural. So there would be the equivalent, but Elohim is not the name that Moses wanted. Am I correct? In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, when God was asking him to go down to Egypt, he turned to God, and what is it he asked God? Give me your name. What is your name? So when I go down to Egypt, those down in Egypt, the Israelites, will know what God you represent. And what's the name he gave at that time? Yahweh. Jehovah is correct, just four letters. And that's the name he took with him, and that's the name you will find 6,823 times in the Old Testament. 
Elohim, you'll only find about 2,000 times. Adonai, you'll find about 340. So you can see by far which is the most important name for God, and that is not in the Quran. I'm going to keep pointing at you. Don't take it personally, okay? They have no idea. They have no, in fact, I've never seen a Muslim that can answer that. Have you seen someone that can answer that? Here's the problem. I go to Britain. I am the ambassador for the United States. I come to the Queen. I go to Buckingham Palace. I introduce myself to the Queen. I said, hello, my name is Jay Smith, and I represent the President of the United States. So, I, she says, okay, the President. What's his name? I have no idea. What kind of ambassador would I be if I don't even know the name of my president? In the same token, Muhammad is the greatest and the final of all prophet, and all he can come up with is a title for God, but he doesn't know the name of the God. What kind of a prophet is he? And you can ask Muslims this and see, and that's usually when the penny drops, when they realize that if whoever put the Quran together, why in the world did they use a Nabataean name, and why did they go to a pagan name, and more than that, why did they go to a polytheistic name, when what we know about the Allah of the Quran is he is one. How can he be one if he has a wife? Ooh, I love it. Makes my job so easy. I wasn't going to go here, but thanks for bringing it up. So what do you think we need to do? Now, fortunately, in English and in German, because God comes from German, Gott, it comes from the German God. That is actually a pagan God, is it not? It is a uh, God of the earth in, in some cases. Fortunately, because Christianity has dominated Europe and has dominated German and England, the English language, most everybody who hears the word God now thinks it's the biblical God. Fortunately, fortunately. The problem in the Arabic language is that whenever they hear Allah, immediately what comes to mind is the Quranic God. So I would suggest answering your question, is that we go back to our Bible and put Yahweh back where he belongs. I think we need to put Yahweh back there because look at what God says to Moses in the very next verse, in verse 15. After he gives him his name, he then says to Moses, this shall be my name forever. So why have we got rid of Yahweh? Let's put it back. Well, they used Jehovah, so I prefer to go with Yahweh, so people don't get, uh, and most scholars would say it is Yahweh. Nonetheless, can you imagine if we did that to every Bible, in every language? Would there be any doubt what God we're talking about? We wouldn't even have this discussion. It would be so clear. I mean, it's just like you go out, I just was driving down from the airport, and I saw two golden arches. I didn't even have to know what that was. When you see two golden arches, what is it? McDonald's. McDonald's. If you look at some people have shoes, they're on the shoe. What's that mean? Nike. Nike. You don't even have to know it. But if, that, if we can do that with products today, can you imagine if we had been able to do that with our God? But now we have God in the name of every language. No wonder there's so much confusion. I think God knew what he was talking about. Thanks for bringing that up. I wasn't going to bring it up because it is contentious, but I'll blame you for it if people come back to me on it. Number two. Can God be one yet three simultaneously? Now, this is the whole problem with the Trinity. How do you answer that? Now, there are many ways you can do this. I don't know which is your best. One of the best things I like to do is to find out whether or not they are really serious. In most cases, whenever they ask that question, they really don't want to hear an answer. They use it as what we call a chink in your armor question. They're trying to find a chink in your armor. So what I love to do is I say, listen, I could spend the next three hours telling you my opinion about the Trinity, but you're not going to trust my opinion. I don't even trust my opinion. How about we go to the Bible and let's see what the Bible says about God as one, yet three. What you're doing is you're making a test and you're asking them whether or not they're really serious. Because if they say yes, then you've got a Bible study. You can open up the Bible and you can go through and you can really start unpacking where all the way from the very beginning of the Bible, starting with the very first verse of the Bible, you can start to see where the God as one, yet three, is right through Genesis, Exodus. In fact, we have a, we have a paper that we put out uh, that where we have uh, Dr. Paul Blackham has gone through almost every chapter of Genesis showing where you can find the Trinity. Page after page after page. It's brilliant. Don't even start the New Testament. Start with the Old Testament. You can do that, and it's great. It's uplifting, and I have found when you sit down with Muslims to do that, they usually do not have a problem. But see, then it's not you speaking. It's Scripture speaking. There are very few Muslims that will want to do that. And then you know pretty much that they're not really interested in this question. So I said, well, listen, if you're not going to let me go and show you in Scripture, which is my authority where God is, then why don't we just talk about something we can agree upon? But what I like to do is I like to go another step with them. I like to go and I say, listen, let me ask you something. Your God is one, monad, 
one singular. And he's defined by many names. And the names that you have, you have 99 of them. The 99 names, but what are the three most common? What are the three most important names? Well, we've already done them. Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, Al-Wadud. What is Al-Rahman? Al-Rahim. Compassionate. Al-Wadud. Al-Wadud, the friendly. Loving. Loving. Okay, so there you have the three. And those are the three I like to start with. You can almost talk to about any of them, but those are the three best ones because they're in, they're in the Bismillah, which is the very first verse of the Quran. And every Muslim knows the Bismillah. But more than that, they have to, every time before they pray, they have to start with the Bismillah. So say, let's just take those three. So, compassionate, merciful, loving. By definition, in order to be compassionate and merciful and loving, you need an object to your compassion. Am I correct? You need an object, object to your mercy. You need an object to your love. Am I correct? Otherwise, you're just loving yourself. How can you be compassionate and merciful to yourself? So here's what I ask. Are these names, are they his eternal names? Well, yes, they define him. He doesn't create them as he goes along. Your names are there from the very beginning, especially if they define him, his character, and his character has not changed eternally. So these are his eternal names. So I ask them, all right, then let me ask you, before Adam and Eve were created, who is he loving and merciful and compassionate to? Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. And you can see the gears start to turn. This doesn't make any sense. Allah cannot be merciful or compassionate if there's no object to his mercy or compassion or love. Until Adam and Eve are created, until there is an object, another, then there, this makes no sense. And more than that, as a Christian, I love that question because my God is compassionate, merciful, and loving. But he has always been compassionate, merciful, and loving within the triune Godhead. God the Father has always loved God the Son. God the Son has always loved God the Holy Spirit. That has always existed. That's why I know that I'm made in his image. That's what it says in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, if I'm made in his image, therefore I am loving, I am compassionate, I am merciful, I know where I get it from. I get it from my God, who has always exemplified it within the Godhead. Now see what I've done. Immediately what I've done is I've taken three names they already understand, show that no God that is a monad can even understand this name, but then there also I'm saying, you in order to understand these three terms, you're going to have to come back to my God. Come on home. From that, you can then get into a great discussion because what you will find, Muslims, though, I'm going to trip over this yet. Muslims, though they have never thought through this before, they need to. They need to understand that the triune, the Trinity, by definition, if my God is triune, then how is it that I am relational? Where do you think my relationship comes from? As a social animal, we're all social animals. How could it come from a God that is one? Put Isaiah 63 in your margin and just put that as a reference so you can go back to that. The, but she's coming up, now she's going on the offensive. Here's the polemic. So she started out with a defense, apologetic, by going to Isaiah 63. Said there's the three names for God. So my Bible is very clear that he is one all the way through. Deuteronomy 6.4 is very clear on that. Yahweh, Eluhenu, Yahweh, Echad. But then 63 has all three within Scripture. So Scripture is very clear, one yet in three persons. Now let's look at the Quranic reference to this, and you have to go to chapter 5, verse 116 in the Quran, or Surah 5, Ayah 116. In Surah 5, Ayah 116, as Hatun is pointing out, who are, the, who are the three persons there? Can you see a problem there? So now she's gone on the polemic and saying, hold on a minute. If Allah is all-knowing, why did he allow this to be put in your Quran when this does not represent anything? that any, There's no Christian that I know of, at least not living today. Historically, there were. There are some groups that did believe Mary was part of the Trinity. Okay. Number three, and this is another biggie. Can God have a son? Yeah. Now, what he is saying is correct. Much of this is coming out of the European. This is coming out of the European milieu. This is, not, this is something you do not get in Egypt. We're getting this from Pakistanis and Indians and Bangladeshis. They're way ahead of the Arab world. You weren't here when we talked about it. Mm -hmm. The Indian subcontinent is much further ahead. Um, case in point, look at all the major debaters. In fact, give me the names of all the best debaters in the Muslim world today. Ahmadidat, where is he from? No, he is, that's right, but where is he from? India. Zakir Naik, Bombay. Shabir Ali, India, the people we have to work with, Adnan Rashid, Pakistan, Mansur Ahmed, Bangladesh. And the reason for that has an awful lot to do with the British. They colonized 
those three countries and made it one. And they introduce in the English educational system, which still exists today. I grew up in India. I was born in India. I, my, parent, my father was born in India. My grandfather died in India. I, my family's been in India since 1913. And all of our education from middle school on up is all in English because we have, well, in India alone, we have 300 languages. You can't have education in 300 languages in the same way in Pakistan and Bangladesh. So therefore, they make English as the medium. Now, by doing that, that means that they get all the best material from all around the world, and they get it much quicker than the Arabs get it. But more than that, they engage with this at a much quicker letter. And that's why almost all of the ones that you're going to be confronted by, if you go up on YouTube, those names are all over new YouTube. Adnan Rashid, Zakir Naik, Ahmad Didat, Shabir Ali, there's thousands of videos. They're way ahead of the Arab world. So you're right, in the Arab world, this doesn't come up because Christians don't appear very, you're very small in the Arab world. You're not a threat. This is not really, this is not something that, in fact, when we have uh, at Speaker's Corner, everybody comes to Speaker's Corner, rarely do we see Arabs take us on in any of these. It's always Pakistanis, it's always Indians. I was asked to fly down to um, Kenya, uh, to Mozambique to do a week of training for all the IMB uh, missionaries from Yemen, Oman, Somalia, Kenya, and Tanzania. And I remember coming down there and I was scratching my head and I said, why have you called me down here? I don't, I don't work in Africa. I've never hardly been in Africa. I have never been to those countries before. And they said, because all of our missionaries are being hit with material from a man named Zakir Naik. I said, Zakir Naik? He says, yes, they're all pulling it down from the internet. All of these now are available to all these countries. And what they're doing is they're finding that this, the best material are all these speakers. They do their work in India, but their YouTube has, shot, has spread them all over the world. And they say, we have never heard these kind of questions before. You have brought, been brought up with these questions. So that's why we want you to train us up. So you're going to get it. I can't say for, for Dushanbe and places like that. I've not been there. But what we're hearing all over the east coast of Africa, this is all they get. I just got back from spending time in Ethiopia, uh, in Togo, in Ghana, and in Zambia. Four different countries. And in every case, every question that came to me were from people like Ahmad Didat, Shabir Ali. Their names just come pouring in. And they're all from the Indian subcontinent because it's all in English. Okay, let's jump to the Son of God. So how do you deal with the Son of God? Now remember, the Son of God is a big one because Muslims assume that whenever we're using that term, we're talking about a biological term. So you can understand that. I would suggest when you probably first heard it, that was also a problem for you. How could Jesus be the Son of God? The first thing that comes to your mind, especially in English, there is only one definition. That's a biological son. Am I correct? It's the same way in Italian, biological son. Yet there's no one in this room that believes that God had sex with Mary to have Jesus. Am I correct? No. So where did that come from? Why is it that you don't have a problem with that? The reason is because you've been told that this is not a biological relationship. Now in Arabic, it's even easier because you have two different words for sonship. You have Walid and Ibn. Yes, right. Yeah, Walid is biological. Ibn can be, now let me ask you, where are you from? Are you a son of Egypt? Yeah. Oh, uh, wait a minute. So you're a biological son of, son of Egypt? No, we say the son of the Nile. Okay, you're a son of the Nile? Yeah. You're actually born of the Nile? No. There's a biological relationship? Okay, okay, I'm done. And see, we always do that. <laughs> Where are you from? You're a son of Italy, aren't you? Yes. And you're proud of it. Am I correct? So immediately when we say you're a son of something, immediately we can realize there's another meaning. And in Arabic, that already exists. Ibn can mean anything that is relational. You were related to the Nile. You're related to Italy. I am a son of India. Okay? So bring that into your conversation, especially with Arabs. It's so easy. But I want to get even one, go one step further. In chapter 39, verse 10 of the Quran, or is it verse 4? 39.4, I think it is. In chapter 39, verse 4, it says, If Allah so had willed it, he could have a son. Ooh, tu, 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 tu. Throw that right back on them. So hold on, the Quran is saying that Allah can have a son. Now ask them, how can he have a son unless it's a biological son? See, immediately you put the throw, you've thrown it right back on them and say, Now you tell me, explain to me. Because that is a biological son. Now, can you understand? Immediately they are putting back and they realize, ah, so the Quran even accommodates this. You can also use chapter 2, verse 177. In chapter 2, verse 177, 
it says that someone who is traveling from one city to another is a Ibn Ulsibili. What does Ibn Ulsibili mean? Ulsibili. Uh, son of the road. So a traveler is a son of the road. So that's in the Quran. So use these verses and say, obviously, even the Quran accommodates sonship that is not biological. It inherits it. It's an inheritance. It's a relational title. But, but that doesn't uh, reflect the truth about Jesus. Ah. It's an equal, not, not a metaphor. I know. So now you end off with, now, actually, it is Ibn Allah. Ibn Allah means that everything that God inherits Jesus inherits. Yeah, but that's not the same as Ibn Ni, uh, son of the man. Yes. So now you're putting content to it. And, and I, this is, you have to end off with this. So when Jesus takes the title, Son of God, he's not talking about biological at all. He's talking like the son of the Nile. He's talking about the son. But more than that, he's going even further than that. He's saying by calling himself the Son of God, because you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God, we're all sons and daughters of God, but none of us in this room are, is the Son of God. Definite article. Then you need to go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 62 to 66, where... Caiaphas, who is the chief priest there in the Sanhedrin, he asked Jesus this very question. Are you the Son of God? Not a Son of God. Are you the Son of God that we're waiting for? The Son of God inherits everything that the Father inherits. Basically, this is a divine term. When Jesus answered, yes, I am, and then he went and answered, and he actually added a third day because he just got done saying he was the Messiah, he was the Son of God. That's in verse 62. In verse 63, he then it says, and you shall see the Son, the Son of God, referring to Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. Son of man. Did I say Son of God? Sorry. Son of man. Thank you for correcting me. The Son of Man. There's a third title. Look and see the reaction of Caiaphas. He tore his robe because he knew that Jesus was claiming three different divine titles for God. So when we're saying Son of God, when Jesus claims it, and 25 times he uses this, he is referring to that divine title. And that's why the Jews had to finally kill him because he, a mere man, was taking on God's holy name. Ooh, I love it. And that segues right into the next question. Where does Jesus say, I am God? Start, I like to start with Matthew 26 because it's so easy because you get three right there within three verses. And you get the reaction of Caiaphas. But there's probably a better one. There's a fourth name for God that we've already talked about in this room. What's that name that Moses needed? Back in Exodus chapter 3. Okay, and where is that found in the New Testament? Where does Jesus claim that? John 8.58. John 8, 58 is a very good one for Muslims to go to. The reason why is because he's in the temple, therefore he would have been speaking Hebrew. Though it's written in Greek, ego eimi, he would have been speaking Hebrew to those who were questioning him because they were Jews that were questioning him. They said, how, do, how can you claim to know Abraham and you're not even 50 years old? And Jesus' response was, before Abraham was Yahweh. He would have used Yahweh. Now in Greek it's ego eimi, and there's an awful lot of back and forth uh, whether or not ego eimi or ho'on is the same as Yahweh. I believe it is. Nonetheless, because he gave that claim, look at the very next verse and see how the reaction of the Jews. What did they do? To, they wanted to stone him. Why? Because he, a mere man, was taking that name. So use that. I think it's great that you can always go right back to Scripture, like Hatun has been doing, like we're doing. Go back to Scripture and just let the Muslims see this. So you can see where Jesus is claiming those names for God. Let's go on to the next one, and that is, is Jesus the true prophet or Muhammad? Sooner or later, you're going to have to talk about Muhammad. Be careful. Be careful when you talk about Muhammad. We have found, haven't we, Hatun, that when you talk about Allah, they're not going to get too upset. When you talk about the Quran, yeah, they'll get up a little bit more upset. When you mention Muhammad, what happens? It's like a I, I, I'm, to me, it's almost like a switch turns on inside them, and they go visceral. There's something about Muhammad in every. It doesn't matter where you are in the Muslim world. This happens. It's not just in the Arab world. It's not just in Pakistan, in India, where I grew up, at Speaker's Corner. You do not touch Muhammad. So be careful. That's all I'm going to say now, all right? Let us do it. We take on Muhammad all the time, and we love it, because we love it when they go visceral, because then you know you're really getting, you're starting to scratch where they itch or where they hurt. But what you can do is you can do a comparison. 
What I like to do, I remember did this, I did this when I was, um, I, I had gone to Detroit to do a talk, a talk there, and they had, they had this great fair. They used to have it open every July, uh, which would be an Arab fair in Detroit, Dearborn, because there's about uh, 600,000 Arabs that live in Dearborn who work at the car factory there, the Ford, Ford factory. So we would go, and I remember going there one day, and I saw a man with a sign walking up and down, Jesus and Muhammad, we love them both. So I went up to the man and I said, I'm so glad you have Jesus above Muhammad. It's so important that you keep him above Muhammad. He is much greater than Muhammad. And of course, the man said, no, 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 no. We love them both. They're both equal. I said, no, no, no. He's much greater. He's much greater. Let me look at Let me show you. And I said, I'm going to open up your Quran and I'm going to prove from your Quran that Jesus is greater than Muhammad. So I'm not going to the Bible here. I'm going to the Quran. I'm using what they already are familiar with. And I'm also using what they will accept. And I said, let's start, and I just went to two chapters, and you can put these verses down. They're just four verses I'm going to give you. I started with chapter 19, verse 20. And I said, in chapter 19, verse 20, it says that Issa, Issa was born of a virgin. And so I asked the fellow, was Muhammad born of a virgin? Did Muhammad have a miraculous verse? No. I said, well, why should that be so important? Something is unique. He's born of a virgin. And I said, you don't know the answer, do you? And I said, when you ever have a question, who are you supposed to come to? Chapter 10, verse 94. Chapter 21, verse 7. Oh, Muslims, if you have any question, go to the people of the book. Come back to us. You're you're told to ask us. I will tell you why the virgin is so important. And I said, you need to go to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 8, verse 14. Isaiah 7, 14, like Daniel 7, 14. 7 is the perfect number. Double it, 14. I'm going to get as easy as I can for you all. Isaiah 7, 14, it's very clear. It says... For this shall be a sign. Okay, wake up, Muslims. This shall be a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son. 800 years before this to happen, you hear this prophecy about this virgin. I said, that's why you need to go back to the scriptures. You need to come back to us. But read on the rest of it, I said to him. A virgin will conceive and bear a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. That's why it had to be a virgin. Because when the virgin conceives, God's with us. He's here on earth. Then I jump to chapter 3, verse 46. Chapter 3, verse 46, it says that this Issa spoke from the cradle. Could Muhammad speak from the cradle? No. Yet Issa was able to speak from the cradle. Three verses later, chapter 3, verse 49, it says that Issa took some clay, fashioned them into birds, blew on them, and they flew up into the air. So he created out of nothing. Could Muhammad do any miracle? Absolutely not. Three times the Jews asked him in the Quran to do a miracle. His only response was, I, the prophets before did miracles and you killed them. I'm nothing more than a warner. Not much of a defense. So here you see, Issa is born of a virgin. Muhammad is not. He could speak from the cradle. Muhammad could not. It says that he created out of nothing. Muhammad could not. And then it says in the same verse that he gave sight to the blind, healed the lepers, and resuscitated the dead. Three more things that Muhammad could not do. Muhammad could not give sight to anybody. He usually cut out the eyes of those. Did he ever give uh, heal to anybody? No, he usually made them sick. Did he ever resuscitate the dead? No, he usually killed them. Just the opposite. So you can see in just three verses, I found six differences, and in every case, Jesus is superior. And then come back to chapter 19 again, this time verse 19. In chapter 19, verse 19, so now you've come full circle. There you have Jibril who's coming to Mary and says to Mary, Behold, I am going to give you a righteous son. What does righteous mean? Holy, sinless. And the neat thing about that is you can ask many Muslims, why is it they have such a hard time of believing that God could enter time and space? Why is it they cannot understand why God could take on human form? And usually their reaction is, how could God become corrupted like us? How could God take on sinful human form? We're sinful, we're human. How could God take on human form? And I say, well, your Quran answers it in chapter 19, verse 19. If God is truly God, can he not enter time and space and still remain uncorruptible? Absolutely, even your Quran says so. The sinless one. Was Muhammad sinless? No. Chapter 48, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 48, verse 1 and 2. It's God is talking to Muhammad and he says, 
He says, for, ask forgiveness for the sins you are, have done and the sins you are yet to do. So even as a prophet, according to the Quran, Muhammad continued to sin, but not Jesus, not Issa. Now, on, I have a whole list of differences that you can do. You, I can give this to you, any of you who want it. Just bring up a flash drive, I'll hand you the, all my notes on what I've gone this afternoon. But there's a whole list of doing a comparison back and forth uh, between Jesus and Muhammad. I'm gonna hold off on that because you're gonna be talking about Issa versus Jesus. Okay, let's back up a little bit. Most of the time we do Jesus with Muhammad, am I correct? And we do Quran yeah. with the Bible. What's the problem with that? Uh, that, that they're, they're not comparing they're, that. That's right, they're not the same. Are you hearing what he's saying? The tendency that we always have is to pair, compare the Bible and the Quran. And there really is not, the, they're not the same, they're not the same model. Jesus and Muhammad are not really the same model as well. Because for the, the Quran for a Muslim is their primary revelation. That's it. The Quran is all they've got. Muslims do have nothing without the Quran. It is the only revelation of God that is eternal. That's the first thing. It's the only revelation of a God that is sent down to earth over a 22-year period to a man named Muhammad. It's the only revelation that was complete at the time of Uthman, and it's the only revelation that has been unfettered by human hands. As Hatun said, there has been no change, not even a dot has changed in 1,400 years. So those are the four claims they make about our about their Quran. Do we make that about our Bible? Would any of you say the Bible is eternal? Please don't. Was it sent down? No. Was it complete? Yes, we would admit to that part. At one point, the originals, autographs, were complete. Have they been changed? Of course they've been changed. We know where the changes are. We're very transparent about it. We put it in there. We put a line before, Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to 20. They put a line there to warn the readers that we don't know whether or not this is from the original autograph because we don't have the original autograph for those verses. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 53 to John chapter 8, verse 11, the story of the woman caught in adultery. That is not in the earliest Greek manuscripts. And especially 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, it should not be in our Bible at all because that was only introduced in Fort, uh, the 1600s, in the 1611 King James Version. That was the first time that was introduced. Okay, so we are very open about it. We know there have been changes, but we know where the changes are. All right? So don't do a comparison. Don't even make those claims about the Bible. So what you're suggesting is, well, then what can we do? Well, here is a better suggestion. Instead of comparing Jesus, I'm sorry, instead of the Bible and the Quran, why don't you compare the traditions the Bible is like the Islamic traditions. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there are four genres of what we call the Islamic traditions. To know how you're to act, how you're to live as a Muslim, you have to go back to the example of Muhammad. And the example of Muhammad is found in four different uh, types of writings. One is called the Siddha, the Siddha to Rasulullah, which would be the biography of Muhammad. And the other is called the Hadith, which would be the sayings of Muhammad. Uh, the third would be the Tafsir, which would be the commentaries on the Quran. And the fourth would be the Tahrik, which would be the histories. Those are the four Islamic traditions, the Sunnah of the Prophet, the example of the Prophet. All written in the 9th and 10th century and later, but not before the 9th century. Muhammad died in the 7th century. Do you see a problem immediately? None of this existed for 200 years. Okay, now... Where is the parallels for that? Well, let's start with the Siddha of Jesus. Do we have a Siddha for Jesus? Do we have a biography of Jesus? Yes, we do. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The black letter part of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do we have the Hadith of Jesus? Yes, we do. Anytime it's a red letter, that's what Jesus spoke. There's the Hadith of Jesus. There's the parallels. Do we have the Tafsir, the commentaries? Yeah, Paul's letters are commenting on what Jesus did. What he said, he then comments and shows how it's supplied in Philippi and Corinth and Ephesus. So there's the, the commentaries. And then do we have a history of the Tahrik, the book of Acts? So the exact same four genre that they have in the Islamic tradition, we have in the New Testament. That's the parallel. So therefore, what's the parallel with the Quran? If that's their final revelation, if that's their eternal revelation, if that is their primary revelation, who is our final revelation? Who is eternal? Who came to earth? Jesus. Can you then see Jesus fits the very thing they claim about the Quran? Jesus is eternal, am I correct? Jesus did, was sent to earth, am I correct? Jesus is complete and Jesus does not change.
So the four things they're claiming about the Quran, we claim about Jesus, but as we're going to find on Tuesday night, we're going to destroy those claims about the Quran Tuesday night. Hold on I'll, until we do that. So wait till that on Tuesday night. Let's go then to the next one. Does, turn the page. Was Jesus crucified? Another biggie because this is at the very foundation of everything we believe. We've got to answer that question. See, most of us have been told to zero in on the resurrection because when you're talking to atheists and Jews, you've got to talk about the resurrection. For Muslims, no, there was no resurrection because Jesus never died. Okay? You've got to change gears with Muslims. So you've got to take on the crucifixion, and the crucifixion is denied in chapter 4, verse 157. So that's why you need to therefore ask, and I ask five questions immediately, and I go right to the Muslims, I say, okay, there are five problems. If you believe that the Jesus never died, according to one verse in your Quran, you can, let me show you the first problem. The first problem is are you have an internal contradiction, because in the Quran it's very clear that Jesus did die as well. In chapter 19, verse 33, Jesus himself says, claims, blessed be me the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I rise again. So he's claiming that he died. And he's claiming it as a child. So when they say, no, that's the future, ten, of course, he's a child. He's going to die. He's yet to die. Okay? You can throw that back at them. If they say, no, this is for a future time, then jump to verse 15, because it says the exact same thing about John the Baptist. Blessed be he, the day he was born, dies and rises again. And then you can jump to chapter 3, verse 55, because in 355, it says, God, Allah, is speaking to Jesus, and he says, for I will mutawafika. What does that mean in Arabic? Mutawafika. Yeah. I will cause you to die. I will cause you to die. I will put you to death. I will cause you to die. Now be careful because in your English translations, all the translations is I will put you to sleep or they just don't even translate it. Since the 1930s, all the English translations have now taken that word out. They, but you can't take it out of the Arabic. It's still there in the Arabic. Mutawafika. It's also repeated in chapter 5, verse 117. So there is an internal contradiction. You have chapter 19, verse 33. You have chapter 3, verse 55. You have chapter 5, verse 117. They contradict chapter 4, verse 157. Let the Muslims deal with it. Thank God we don't have that contradiction. Number two, you've got a theological contradiction. Because in chapter 6, verse 164, in chapter 53, verse 38, it says very clearly that nobody can take on the guilt of another. So what was that man? If, no, if Jesus didn't die, someone did die on the cross, another man took his place. What was that man taking his place? That's a theological contradiction. Then you have the historical problems. We do know historian after historian from the first century. Thallus, who was uh, debating Phlegon in 52 AD, they were debating the death of Jesus, and they were talking about the fact that the sun went dark and the earth shook. In 52 AD, Jesus died in 33 AD, within 20 years. You have reference from a Greek historian. You have Tacitus, who is a Roman historian, writing at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, who not only mentions the death of Jesus, mentions that it happened during the time of Pontius Pilate, under the, uh, uh, the authority of Tiberius, proving that it happened in 33 AD. So there's a Roman historian agreeing to that fact. Josephus is a Jew Jewish historian who not only says and talks about the death of Jesus, he mentions also that the Christians believe that he rose again, the only non, the known secular reference we have to the resurrection. So there you have Greek, Roman, and Jewish historians that believe that Jesus died. Show me one historian in the first 600 years that denied the crucifixion. And I've been waiting for 35 years for Muslims to show me. They can't. Now, then we end with the moral problem, and this is probably the most difficult one for Muslims to answer. If Jesus did not die, another man took his place, what was he doing three days later going into the upper room and claiming that he had died? Does a prophet lie like that? And a week later, when Thomas comes and actually questions him, he shows the holes in his hands and his feet. What kind of prophet lies like that? What kind of God would send this man, another man, to his death, put the image of this man on another man, and send that man to his death, and then not tell anybody for 600 years? And then 600 years, say, oh, let me tell this man over here in Arabia who can't even read and write the real story. Is that the kind of God we have? Is that the kind of God that we have in the Bible? My God does not lie like that. Thank God we don't have a deceitful God. That's the moral problem, and Muslims have a hard time dealing with that. Number seven, which is the religion of peace? 
after the news we've heard from Egypt today, I think we know that almost a month doesn't go by when we're hearing about one atrocity after another. But you can't use that to answer them. So what I do and what you can do, ask a very simple question, and this is what I always ask. When Muslims claim that the Islam is a religion of peace, that Muhammad was a man of peace, that the Quran is a book of peace, I ask them to come back to me next week and show me one verse in the Quran that says they're to have peace with me. I've asked this for 37 years. They will come up with three verses. One is chapter 2, verse 256, which says there is no compulsion in religion. Probably you've heard that one. Mm -hmm. Ask them to read the rest of the verse and to read the verse that follows it and see if there's no compulsion. For he who stands against Allah and his prophet, great shall be their perdition, for they shall be in hell fire. Now tell me if there's no compulsion. But does that have to do with us? No, that's to do with other Muslims. That is only for Muslims. They like to go to 2.190, which says, if you are attacked, defend yourself, but don't go beyond the limits. Ask them to read the next two verses that follow, because I would like to know what limits they're not to go beyond. And it says very clearly in 193, and slay them wherever ye find them. <laughs> so what limits have they gone to? They can't go any further, I'm dead. So you have to look at the context of all the verses. The favorite one is chapter 5, verse 32, and this is the one that Obama uses, this is the one that all the politicians use, which says, for he who takes the blood of one, it's if he takes the blood of all. He who saves the blood of one, it's if he saves the blood of all. Have you heard that one? Yeah, but it's written in 32. How do you know that? It's written there. Right at the beginning. Tell them to read the beginning of the verse. O children of Israel, he who takes the blood, it's referring to verse 31, which is Cain having killed his brother Abel. It's talking about the blood of Abel. It's a, uh, it's a redemption analysis on the blood of Abel for the children of the Jews. So that's not to do with Muslims. That's not to do with you. Where is the verse that has to do with you? The very next one, verse 33. So just read the next verse. He who stands against Allah and his prophet, crucify them and cut off their hands and feet from opposite ends. How many of you knew that before today? In every case, whenever they come up with a verse, just read the next verse. And you will find it completely contradicts what they're saying. And in 37 years, I have yet to find a Muslim that can find a verse that says they have peace with me. The closest they're going to get is Surah 109, verse 6 which says, to you your religion, to me my religion. But that's almost the end of the Quran. It's one of the first verses that was revealed to Muhammad, if it was revealed to him. In the Quran, you have two different sections. One, you have Medina, the other is Mecca. Mecca is the second half of the Quran, that's the earlier part that was revealed from 610 to 622. Medina is the first half, that's from 622 to 632. When you look at those two halves, they're almost like two different books. All the violence is in the Medinan surahs. 150 violent verses. We're not going to even get into them. Slay the unbeliever wherever ye find them. Cut off the heads of the unbeliever. All in the Medinan. Now, in the Quran, it is aware of these contradictions, so it gives a law of abrogation in chapter 2, verse 106, in chapter 16, verse 101, which stipulates if you have two verses, the first verse is mansuk, the second verse is nasik, which means it abrogates the mansuk. So all the Medinan verses abrogate the Meccan verses. And chapter 109, verse 6 is abrogated by 101 verses. So you can't use it. Isn't that lovely? No, it's terrible. Because it shows how violent the Quran is. If you want to go back to Muhammad, we don't have time, but it's all here in the notes. We can show you also what the notes say. Let's go to number 10. Because Islam is growing so fast and it is so much stronger, won't it beat Christianity? This is the relevancy question. And Muslims always love to talk about the fact that Islam is the fastest growing religion on earth, which it is. That is true. It is the fastest growing. It will soon surpass Christianity by 2050, both Catholics and Protestants. So we've got to wake up to it, folks. We've got to wake up. And we've got to make sure that we know what's happening. Fortunately, Islam has not come in a big way in Europe yet. But it's coming. It's coming by their millions. And I think we need to know how to engage at this level. Now, here's the question. It is the fastest growing religion, but how is it growing? Anybody know? Demographically. Yeah. Demographically, it is the fastest. You are born a Muslim. You do not choose it. Is that how we grow as Christians? No. We choose to become a Christian. 
What the, the statistic you need to look at is what, they, uh, is what they call conversion growth. When you look at conversion growth, Islam is growing about 2.5%, Christianity is growing by 5%. We are double their growth, conversion. And the beautiful thing about that is conversion growth is by choice. Islam does not give you that choice. Chapter 4, verse 89 is the law of apostasy, is built into the Quran. All four schools of law have our dictate that if you leave Islam, you will be, you are. The only difference between the Hanbali, the Hanafi, the Maliki, and the Shafi school is what day you were to be killed. If it's the third day or the tenth day, or in the case of the Hanbali, immediately. So it's very clear that in Islam, the apostasy law is absolute. Yusuf Qaradawi, probably one of the greatest, uh, certainly one of the most popular clerics today, he's in Al Jazeera television in Qatar every night, has this famous quote where he says, without the law of apostasy, without the law of apostasy, there would be no Islam. We are dependent on the law of apostasy.